Man, so glad you're here this morning. I'm excited to share this message. We're in week two of honor, and uh, last week was a great week, wasn't it? You know, for those of you here last week, having Gary, Gary Webb uh, was just awesome. Like the ministry that he does was was great. Daniel, I heard he called you out even in the service and was talking about how he beat you on the basketball court or something like that. Or yeah, so. I'm sure it wasn't true, obviously, and he was just exaggerating. Preachers tend to exaggerate sometimes, right? <laughs> Not me. I'd never do that, but uh... hey, you know, several years ago, I, was, I had this opportunity to go to this really cool uh, leadership conference. It was at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and for three days, we wandered around Gettysburg and the battlefields, and we walked through the three, the three days of the battle that took place at Gettysburg and, lo- and learned all the leadership principles from it. It was a fascinating, really cool leadership conference. And it was at this conference that I learned about this guy named Joshua Chamberlain. He was a hero at Gettysburg, and his heroics earned him a Medal of Honor. And then he was promoted to a general. He led the Northern Army as a general in several campaigns. And then at the very end of the Civil War, he was asked to be the general to take the army down to where the Confederate army was going to surrender their arms and their colors. And so he took the army down there, and it was an interesting moment in the, for our country. You know, as the Civil War comes to an end for the Confederates, for the southern states, I mean, this is, this is uh, embarrassing. This is humiliating. They're having to march in in front of the northern army, and they surrender their arms. They surrender their flags, their colors. And, I mean, just think about how that would feel for them. And, you know, in, in this day and age, we live in a country where we see lots of fighting, but it's nothing like what they went through. Like, that was fighting for reals, and people were losing their life by the hundreds of thousands. In fact, more people lost their life in the Civil War than in World War I, World War II, and uh, Korean War combined. And I think even in the battle for independence, I think all of those combined, more people lost their lives in our country from the Civil War. This was a tough, tough time for our country. And one might even think, how could the country survive such a monumental division? And so Joshua Chamberlain was the general, like I said, who was kind of there hosting the, the Southern Army coming in to surrender. And when the general of the Southern Army in that moment got up to where he was, Joshua Chamberlain did something that nobody expected and no one even asked him to do. But he put his, his hand up here and he saluted the Southern Army, and he saluted the general. It's a very famous moment in the history of America, of the United States, and it's a very famous moment uh, for the Civil War period. Because no one asked him to do it, like I said. It was not expected. In fact, some people were like, like kind of upset initially. But you know what Joshua talked about? He said, these are our brothers. And they still deserve honor, especially in this moment of humiliation. And so when Joshua Chamberlain, as a general, did this, the entire army of the North did this to all of the Confederate soldiers. Just kind of a signifying of you are our brothers. It's a powerful picture of honor. Not only was Joshua Chamberlain a a guy that had a really cool mustache, (laughs) he was a man of honor. And honor like that moves us, doesn't it? It's something really cool and powerful about honor. So we're talking about honor. And I pray that you and I would grow in our ability to honor each other and our ability to honor God. So here's what honor is. Honor means this, literally. It means to value, to appreciate, and to favorably regard. We're really going to center around this whole value thing. When I honor someone, I am giving value to them. When I'm honoring God, I am giving value to God. So let's be real. We live in a culture that's very quick to dishonor, very quick to devalue other people, right? Have you seen it? Have you felt it? Maybe we've done it before, especially when people disagree with them. When people disagree with them, it's, it, some reason gives them the right, I'm going to devalue you. I'm going to dishonor you because you have a different opinion than I do. Therefore, you lack value in my eyes. That's a very dishonoring thing to do. So we live in a culture that goes there way too often. But I, I'm here to remind us that we live in a different kingdom. We're not a part of the kingdom of this world. As followers of God, we are part of the kingdom of God. And his kingdom operates differently. And we're called to honor We're called to be people of honor. Romans 12 says this, says, be devoted to one another in love. And it says, honor one another above yourselves. Honor one another 
above yourselves. So we're really working hard to create an intentional culture here at Bell Road Church of Honor. We want this to be a place that honors people. No matter who they are, no matter where they come from, we honor people. And we want to honor God. We want to have a very strong culture of honor in this church. That's why we're taking a few weeks to talk about this really important topic of, of honor. So we want to honor. Not just because God tells us to, but really because honor is our privilege. It is a privilege for us to honor one another. And we'll talk about that next week. But today we're really going to focus in on how we're called to honor God. And here's the message I want you to catch today. When you honor, it opens the door for God to move in your life. When you honor, you are opening the door for God to move in your life. Okay, so let's go to Mark chapter 6. We're going to look at an interesting story in the life and the ministry of, of Jesus here. Mark chapter 6. All right, you guys with me? You guys awake? You guys here? Okay, good. All right, awesome. Just want to make sure. Verse 1 says, it says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him, this, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives and his own house, is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. This is fascinating. Jesus goes to his hometown, the place that he grew up. And it doesn't say that he would not perform miracles. It actually says that Jesus could not perform miracles. He could, this is the Messiah. This is the God man, Jesus we're talking about. He could not perform miracles. Why is that? You see there that they lacked faith. They were without faith, but what was it that caused their lack of faith? It was a lack of honor. Yeah. So I'm saying honor opens the door for God to move in your life, but also a lack of honor can shut the door for God to move in your life is what's taking place in his hometown right here. Yeah. So they struggled with this belief in who Jesus was because they didn't honor him. See, a lack of honor will cause us to have a lack of belief in God. This is why honor is so important. Lack of honor causes a lack of belief in God. Now, you got to understand this. There is a definite connection between our faith, the faith that we have, and what God does in and through our life. You've got to understand that. So many times Jesus said throughout the Gospels, throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he said, your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you well. You go through the four Gospels and see how many times Jesus actually said that. It's fascinating. So there is a definite connection between our faith and what God does in and through us. So it's not a faith in the sense of earning it. I got to have a strong faith and earn it. You know, because Jesus says, all you need is a faith the size of a mustard seed and you can move mountains. And so I'm not trying to like earn this faith. It's really a faith that simply trusts in God and who he is. It's a strong faith that has a strong trust in him. It's not an emotional twisting of God's arm. It's just, I trust who God is. I, I trust in his promises. And so I literally believe who God is and I believe what he said. I believe he can do the impossible. Do you believe that? Do you have that type of faith in your life? Are you believing God for the impossible in your life? I mean, Jesus says your heavenly father will give good gifts to those who ask him. Those are his words. He says, if two of you agree about anything here on earth, whatever they ask for, he says, my, my father, it will be done by my father in heaven. Okay, the Bible promises that with God, all things are possible and nothing is impossible with God. I like to reverse both of those, okay? With, with him, all things are possible and nothing is impossible with God. Do you have that type of faith that you're believing for the impossible? It's, it's a faith that we need to have. And it's not a, a, a earning it faith. It is a faith that I just simply trust in God. And so how do I have a faith like that? It starts with honor. You got to honor him. We'll talk about how to do that in practical ways. But remember this, honor is giving value. So it's you and I giving value to God above everything else in our life. 
I've seen people actually have a strong faith in God for years, and then all of a sudden it wandered away. You know, their heart faded away. You know, maybe it's slowly over time, or it was instantaneously because of situations in their life. But well, for whatever the reason, the core issue was this. They began to lack an honor for God in their heart. Yeah. Honor, a lack of honor for God causes a lack of belief in God. Okay, now verse 3 says something very interesting. Maybe you picked this up in the story too, but verse 3, when Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, it says they took offense to him. Did you catch that? They were offended by Jesus and his words. They took offense to him. So whose fault is that, that they were offended? Was it Jesus' fault or was it their fault? And see, we got to understand that when we find ourselves in this place where we're offended, it's really more on us. It is us. It is up to us to determine how we're going to respond in situations, how we're going to receive words, how we're going to receive and interpret situations. It is on us. Now, sometimes people are just blatantly just like evil and mean, and that's, it can be obviously offensive. But for the most part, we got to understand that we oftentimes take offense to things we shouldn't take offense to. And this is what's going on in this situation right here. They're taking offense to Jesus. But here's the deal. I, I can't control what happens to me, but I can control what happens in me. I can control how I respond to certain situations. But these people are getting offended, and it's interesting. Jesus is just teaching in the synagogue. This is their, their hometown church. This is the church that Jesus grew up going to. So these people are listening to Jesus. They're like, I know this guy. Like, I grew up with him. I played on a soccer team. I went to school with him. He made our kitchen table. We know his parents, his brother. Like, we know everything about it. There's no way that he can be the Messiah. So they didn't believe that he was the Messiah because Jesus didn't come the way they wanted him to come. Therefore, they didn't honor him. And their lack of honor led to an offended heart. Or I could say it this way, an honorless heart can lead to an offended heart. Okay, it doesn't always lead there, but an honorless heart can lead to an offended heart. So don't let your heart go there. And if you find yourself in this place where, like, I, I feel really hurt or offended, you've got you've to forgive. You've got to let it go. Let love cover a multitude of sins and, and start right there and let it go. Don't allow your heart to go there. It's not worth it because it takes you to, down scary, scary paths and scary roads. So, man, these hometown friends of Jesus, they missed out on a lot. Their lack of honor caused an unbelief. It caused them to be offended. But really what took place is they missed out on the miraculous power of Jesus too. Because remember, it says that Jesus, did, he didn't say he would not. It says that he could not do any miracles. The same is true for us, guys. The lack of honor in our heart, in our life towards God can hinder the move of God in our life. That's what I'm saying. Honor opens the door for God to move in your life. That is how powerful and important honor is. Well, if you want to see God move in your life, honor him. You want to see his power in your life? Honor him. You want to grow in your relationship with him? Honor him. You want to experience that glory to glory to glory that the Bible talks about? You've got to live a life that honors God. It all starts and centers around honor. Honor. And here's what I've learned is that honor really starts with humility. Humility. I got to have a humble heart in order to have a heart that honors. I love what James 4 says in the New Living. It says, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. And so God wants to lift you up. God wants to honor you. It's pretty cool. But it starts with you and I humbling ourselves before the Lord. You know, you don't see this much anymore, but back in, you know, in old times, you see this in movies where people would bow down before the king or the ruler. What was that to signify? It was... Uh, it was a posture of honor, right? They bow before the honor. I'm going to honor you. But you think about this physical posture. It's a posture of humility. Right. It's, it's humbleness. And this really needs to be the posture of our heart. That's why sometimes I love to get down on my knees because it's an outward physical posture that reminds me where I want my heart to go. I want to be in this place, so physically I'm going to get there to remind me that I want this to encompass my whole life, which includes my heart, because this is a position of humility. And humility begins with honor. Proverbs 18 says, Haughtiness goes before destruction, and humility precedes honor. Now, I love that word, haughtiness. Haughtiness. It's not talking about physical attraction. 
hot, it's not talking about your haughtiness, okay? As far as physical attraction, you're all, you're all beautiful, handsome people, okay? Haughtiness refers to pr- uh, being prideful and arrogant, okay? That leads to destruction, but humility precedes honor. I gotta be in a posture of humility in order to honor God. Honor opens the door for God to move in your life. So how do we live a life that honor? I want to give you a few practical suggestions. If you're taking notes, write these down. Okay, so how can I live a life that honors God? Number one, I can honor him with my finances. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Honor the Lord with your, with your wealth, with the money that you make, with their, your first fruits, which is that first portion, which is the tenth. It's a tithe principle. And that's how you and I can actually honor God with our finances. It's saying, God, I value you more than I value my money. And so I'm going to honor you, put value on you with my money. That's how we honor God with our finances. We honor God with our body. The Bible talks about this. 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, your physical body. God lives inside of you. You are his home. Presence of God, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you in your body. Therefore, honor God with your body because you belong to him now. So we want to honor God with our body. Honor God with your gifts. God has given you gifts. you got talents. And when you use them, you honor God. 1 Corinthians 10 says, you know, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So whatever you find yourself doing, do it for his glory. Do it to honor him. And so when you use your gifts, you are honoring him. I've got a video clip about a guy whose life has been recently, in the last year or so, transformed by Jesus, and he's using his gifts to honor God. So I want you to watch this really cool video clip right here. God has called me, and I now have given my life to Jesus Christ, and I work for God. Um, Now, we have Christian innovation in our time. There was a time when the Medici family and all the greatest artists did work for the church. And now it seems like all the best designs and everything have this adult edge to it. And I have a family, I have four children. I've been married for five years. And the perspective, <laughs> because you asked me a question last year, did, you know, did having a daughter uh, change my life? And I've completely turned around from what my perspective was last year to where it is now. And I I feel like there's so few individuals in a position like mine to be able to give their opinion and stand up and say that this is what family is about. And I feel that God is using me and using the choir and using my family to show off because it's like all these things. How many things in your life where it's like this isn't in service for God, but it seems like you're going to get more out of it. This is where you're going to get the better job, better cars, all this. But... We're in complete service to God. Do you feel born again? Do you feel born again, Kanye? Do you feel like, would you consider yourself to be a Christian music artist now? I'm just a Christian everything. Uh Uh-huh. Man, I love that. Just everything that I do, in a sense, what he's saying is, I'm using my gifts now and everything that I do to honor God. I love that. Talking about, you know, in the past, you know, the famous artists, they used their gifts for the church. God has given you gifts. He's given you talents. And yes, you can make money with them. Awesome. Do that. But also use them for God's kingdom. Use it to glorify and honor God and to advance his kingdom. That's why we are big proponents of just getting people involved and serving in church. Some of you, you got the gift of hospitality. Use that for God's kingdom. Some of you, you've got the gift of of you know, making money and giving. Giving is a gift in the Bible, being generous, okay? You, that, do that for God's kingdom. Some of you, you, you're called to lead. Use those gifts for God's kingdom. Whatever gifts you have, use them to honor and glorify God. And I love that he's raising the banner of that right now in our culture in a new and a fresh way. So you can honor God with your gifts. You can also honor God with worship, with your worship. So 
Worship really is a, is a whole life thing, right? Okay, our life is meant to be a worship, but I'm going to really focus in on specific worship where I'm just, you know, I'm praising, I'm worshiping God, which usually we do with song. You don't have to have, or with music. We don't have to have music, but that's typically how we like to do it. Now, interesting words from Jesus. This is in the chapter, right after Matthew chapter 6, chapter 7, Jesus says this. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He's speaking to the religious leaders. He's calling them hypocrites. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. It's possible for you and I to honor God with our lips, but not honor him with our hearts. And so when it comes to worship, we want to not do it with our mouth. We want to do it with our hearts. We want to honor God right here. That's why that worship time within our gatherings is, is very important. It's so, in fact, if you think about it, when we sing in worship and we're praising and worshiping God, it is the only part of our church service that God gets anything out of. The rest of the church, the rest of the service is all designed for us. It's, you know, to help me, to speak to me. It's all about me and my needs. That's the only part that God gets anything out of. And that's the part we need to make sure that we give our best in. And so we don't want to just give lip service as we're singing songs to God. We want to honor him with our hearts, right? It's not church karaoke time. That's lip service. It's with our hearts, I really do worship you and put you first. I'm going to lift you up right now in my life, in my heart. I'm going to honor you, God, with my heart, not just with my lips. And the more you and I honor God to, uh, individually and as a church, the more we'll see the power of God move in our church. This is why I think we should be here on time and in, in this room for the first song. I've been talking to our leaders about this because some of our, sometimes us as leaders are the guiltiest. Like we'll be out there hanging out, talking out, you know, the, the music's going, we're into the second song. Maybe we should get into the service right now. You know, maybe it's time to get in there. You know, hey, can I just speak this into the culture of our church? Let's show up on time or even early and make sure we're in this room for that first song. And let's begin to honor God from the very first moment that the worship band begins to play. And that's the time for us to honor God collectively. And come on. And when we honor God collectively, we are giving God permission to move in power in our church. I think it's that important for us. And so when we show up late and, you know, we all have our different reasons and excuses. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty or step on any toes. But when we show up late, it is a lack of honor. And so I want to show up on time, and from the very moment, I just can begin to honor God. Even if I don't feel like it, it's important for me to honor God, because he's still God. He's, he's always worthy of honor. And so we're just putting him in his rightful place. We're recognizing who he is in our life and where he needs to be in our life. And so I'd encourage us, show up on time. Be here, the first song. Let's be a church that just dives into the sanctuary. We're just going to honor God. We're going to honor God, and in that... We're going to see God move more and more and more in our church. In fact, this Wednesday night, we've got an encounter night. I'd love for you to join us right here in this room, 6.30, Wednesday night. We're going to have worship and prayer night. We're going to seek God. It's a chance for us again to gather together and honor God. And when we honor, God moves in power. When we dishonor, we hinder God's miraculous power and moving in our life. So worship. We want to honor God with our worship. And the last thing is we want to honor God with our firsts. It's kind of a funny thing to say. With our firsts. So our firsts of everything in our life, essentially. You know, Jesus said this, Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you. And Jesus spoke that knowing the condition of our heart because he knows that we're consumed with all these things. My heart's after this. I'm, I'm consumed with this. I'm, I'm stressed about this. I'm anxious about this. I'm worried about this. I'm pursuing this. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Forget, set all that aside and seek me first. And then I'll take care of all that for you. But seek me first. So I want to encourage you to give God your first in everything. But here's a few practical ideas for you. Again, if you're taking notes, write this down. This is good. Give God the first day of your week in worship at church. Sunday is the first day of the week. And so when we show up, I'm giving God my first day. I'm saying, God, I honor you. You are that important. So I'm giving you my first day in church in worship. Give God the first part of your day in prayer and scripture reading. Start your day off like that. However much time you have to take, start your day giving him your first. 
in prayer and in scripture reading. Give God first consideration in all your decisions. That'll help some of us. Instead of, you know, going to this, this book or this, this person or, or whatever, come on, go to God. God, help me speak to me in this decision. Give him your first consideration in all of your decisions. And then we already talked about this, but give him the first portion of all your income. This is showing God, I'm putting you first in my life. I am seeking you first. When we put God first, we are honoring him and we're valuing him. So we could add a few more things to that, but those are just some practical ideas of how you can give God your first. Okay, so remember, honor opens the door for God to move in your life, and I want God to move in your life. So live a life that honors him. So let's look at one last story here. It's in John chapter 4, verse 46. It says this, it says, Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, speaking of Jesus, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, you may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still... On his way, his servants met him with the news that the boy was living. When he inquired us at the time, when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. So it means he's been traveling quite a ways. The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all of his household believed. This is a cool story. And the first thing you notice is that now, Jesus is traveling up to, to, to Cana. This man, this royal official comes from Capernaum. This is a 20 mile journey. He's going way out of his way to seek Jesus. Now, what's really interesting about this is that royal officials did not associate with Jewish rabbis. And so this is kind of a, a different type of a conversation because this didn't typically happen. But for whatever reason, this, this guy traveled 20 miles north because he heard Jesus was in the area. Why did he do that? Desperate times call for desperate measures, right? His son was sick. I'm sure he tried everything. And parents, you know, something's going on with your kid, you're gonna do everything. You're gonna move heaven and earth. Like you're gonna do whatever it takes to take care of your kids. That's, this is a good dad right here. <laughs> I don't forget one night I was leading an event and uh, Amy was actually at home that night, but she called me en route to the hospital and she said, Tyron, I need you to meet me at the emergency room right now because Jaden overdosed on Tylenol. And so we had to get her to the hospital just to make sure she's gonna be okay. And it was just kind of this freaky moment of like, oh, wow. And so I'm in charge of this event. And I, and I turned to a couple of the leaders. I said, you guys in charge, you're in charge, you're in charge, I'm out of here. Because in that moment, I'm taking care of my kid. You know what I'm talking about? As a parent, that's like, okay, here we go. I, this is my priority right now. In fact, it happened again just a, about a month ago. Me and Amy found ourselves in the hospital with Jade, and she had had some major pain, and so we went to the doctor, and then ended up going to the hospital, took, went to the ER, doing all these tests. She you know, did one test and then another test. Both of them were inconclusive. And so then they had to go to the, the scary test. She had to go to the CAT scan, which I guess is not good for kids, you know, the radiation, all that kind of stuff. They were wanting to try to avoid that, but they needed some answers because there was a lot of pain going on in our daughter, and they weren't sure what was going on. And so I know it's a, it's a scary thing for a kid to do because they were hesitant, but also when me and Amy walked into the room, we had to wear these big, huge metal vests as we're standing in the same room that our daughter's being slid into this tube. It's one of those scary days where it's like, okay, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to take care of my kid. We, all the meetings we had that day, canceled. I'm, in, I'm at the hospital with my kid that day, you know, because as a parent, I'm gonna do whatever it takes. So we get this guy, right? 20 miles, traveling, I'm gonna find Jesus. Because I think that he can heal my son. Now what's interesting is you think about who's got the authority in this conversation. The people around looking at this, watching this, observing this would have said, this royal official is a man with authority. But this man with authority is recognizing someone else who's got a greater authority. He's recognizing Jesus and recognizing the authority that Jesus has. He's believing that Jesus has the authority, the ability, and the desire to heal his son. 
and he does. It's important we don't forget Jesus has authority, guys. And he's given you the same authority. You can walk in the authority Jesus has given you. And you want to walk in that every single day so that you can be ready for God to move and work in your life. So Jesus is the one that has the authority really here in this conversation. That's why this royal official is coming to Jesus. And so he asked for his son to, uh, he says, can you come and heal my son? And so Jesus' response in, in verse 48 is interesting. Did you, did you see Jesus' response to this request? Jesus says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. It's kind of an interesting response to a request to heal a kid. But Jesus is kind of talking out of his heart. His heart is sad in the spiritual condition of the nation. Like they want him to do things for them, but they're not really willing to follow him or commit to him, which is still true for a lot of us, right? Like I'll call on you, Jesus, when I need you, but I don't really want to follow you or commit my life to you. And so he's expressing his, his heartfelt sadness about the spiritual condition of people. But that response could have easily offended the guy. Talk about being offended. Like, think about that. If you're going to Jesus, Jesus, could you, could you heal? And he's like this, oh man, people, they just want my healing. That's all they want. This guy could have easily been offended by that response. Wouldn't you agree? He could have been like, well, I thought you cared. Obviously you don't care. Obviously you're the wrong person. And he could have walked away. Had he gotten offended and walked away, he would have missed out on this amazing miracle though, right? He doesn't get offended. And he responds with another request. He said, sir, come down before my child dies. So Jesus says, you may go, your son will live. So how did this man respond in that moment? This is, this is awesome, guys. This man, who's not a Jewish man by any means, he takes Jesus at his word, it says, and he departed. The man took Jesus at his word and he departed. The man took Jesus at his word immediately and he departed. What would your life look like if you took Jesus at his word? How'd that change your life if you really believed his words that he's already spoken to you, about you, for you? If you really took him at his word, how would that change your life? That could have profound implications. Hey guys, I'm convinced you don't need another sermon. You need a word from God. And that can happen in a sermon, but it can also happen in lots of other moments. Maybe as Pastor Vanessa got up here and she had this sense of some you know, people not really wanting to be broken and you needed to hear that. That was a word from God to you. There can be so many moments within our service, but even throughout the days where God speaks to you, you need a word from God. I would encourage you to open up your heart. Open up your mind to him speaking to you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to give you a word. You've got to be open and ready to receive it. And I wish that every single day I had these amazing words from God. It doesn't happen. I pray for that. Uh, it'll be so cool. I'm praying for that to happen more and more. But wouldn't you know it happened last month. Jane had been struggling with lots of pain in her stomach. And... We finally, after several days, took her to the doctor. That's why we decided, you know, that's why, how we ended up in the hospital. But we, we realized we gotta do something about this. So went to the doctor. Amy went first thing early in the morning to take Jane to the doctor. And I'm finishing up and getting ready, getting ready to leave. And as I'm brushing my teeth, I sense God speaking these words to me. He said, I don't cry much, but when I talk about my family, I cry, sorry. <laughs> God spoke to me that morning, guys, and he said, your daughter is sick, but I'm going to heal her. And again, that doesn't happen to me all the time. I wish it did. I wish I had these amazing God moments, but I'm telling you, God spoke to me in that moment. I started getting ready, and here was, here was my mission. I'm driving straight to the doctor to be with my daughter and my wife. I'm saying, Amy, no matter what happens, God's got this. Before I can even leave, they're actually already home wow, that was quick. She's like, we have to go to the hospital right now. In my mind, I'm holding on to this word, but I'm, uh, I'm wondering what's going to happen here. Is this going to be years of sickness before my daughter's healed? I don't know. All I know is that God said, she's sick, but I'm going to heal her. That's all I know. So we go to the doctor, you know, or to the hospital. And we, you know, again, like I said, one test, another test, another test, it's all this inconclusive stuff. One doctor says this, one doctor says this. And 
it was this very emotional, crazy day, but I kept holding on to this word. God's going to heal my daughter. And so I actually had a peace all day about this. There was a peace even in, in our family and in in, even in the room. Jaden had a blast roll, being rolled around in this hospital bed all day long. They took her from one room to the next room to the next room, and she just laid there, you know, and they just circled. She thought, that's kind of fun. But the tests were crazy. And in the end, I mean, literally the doctors just said, man, it seems like she's just plucked up. <laughs> you need to get her to go to the bathroom. And so I was like, okay. I mean, it could have been this, 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 and you know, who knows? I do know that God spoke to me, and some people say, well, maybe it's just a coincidence. Who knows? You know, you, there's nothing really going on. You just got to help your daughter go to the bathroom more, and she's just plugged up and make sure that happens on a regular basis. I don't know. All I know is that God spoke to me, and at the end of the day, my daughter walked out of the hospital, and she hasn't had pain since. And so I just received that as a word from God. I would encourage you to take Jesus at his word. There's going to be moments he's going to speak to you something specific. It, there's going to be other times it's going to come out of his word. Here's what I know. You can't receive a word from God if you're not in the word of God. So you got to get in the word to receive a word. And so we need this book, receive a word from God. I love how this story ends for this royal official. Because his son is healed. He's going home. He has to travel through the night. And the next day, this, one of his servants meets him and says, hey, your son's living. He's, he's healed. Wow, when did it happen? Oh, it happened yesterday at the seventh hour. And the, the guy's like, that's when Jesus spoke those words. Apparently, he checked his watch or he checked the, the sun. He's like, okay, Jesus spoke right then. Okay, he, he knew the exact moment that Jesus spoke to him. So that's when Jesus spoke to me. That's faith. I love that. How did he have faith? Think about this. Here's a man who probably knew nothing or little about the scriptures in comparison to the people in Galilee that grew up with Jesus. They knew all about the scriptures. And this man received a miracle. Why is that? Because of his honor for Jesus. It all centers on honor. Honor. Honor in our heart for Jesus is so important, guys. And it's going to allow God to move in your life in new ways. It could be a breakthrough in your life that you, that you really need. It could be opening doors that you've been knocking on for years. Honor God in your life so that he can move in your life. It all starts with honor. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to pray. The team's going to lead us in that song that we sang earlier, Yes, I, yes, I Will. Yes, I Will, right? That's what it's called. Yeah, Yes, I Will. So I love that because this is a decision. Yes, I will. I'm going to worship him. Yes, I will. I'm going to honor him. And so I'm going to encourage us right now, all together, guys, we're going to honor God together. And as we honor him, as always, you know, there's prayer people in the front and in the back who love to pray with you. Maybe you need God to move in your life. Come and agree with them. The communion tables are open in the front and in the back. And you can thank Jesus for what he did for you, how he provided a way for the Spirit of God to move in your life, for you to be saved and set free and forgiven and healed and, and whole and all that. Remember what Jesus did for you. And this is a chance for us to respond. I always say we're responding to Jesus. And here's our response today, honor. We're just gonna honor him. However you need to do it, just make sure you do it with your heart. Maybe you wanna get on your knees. Maybe you want to come down to the front. Maybe you want to lift your hands for the first time. That's uncomfortable, but it's an outward posture of an inward heart that is honoring him. Whatever you need to do, honor him in these last few moments. Let's pray. Would you join me in prayer, Jesus? We're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for your love and your power that is at work in our life, in our church, and in our world. And so we're praying for more. And so right now we're honoring you. We're lifting you up. We're looking to you. We're worshiping you. We're putting you first. Lord, I pray for someone who may not have a relationship with you right now. I pray, God, that you'd speak to them. I pray that they'd come to a place where they surrender their heart to you, they commit to following you, and they begin living a life that honors you and find out how amazing it is to be in a relationship with their creator, with the God who loves them. Lord, I pray they do that over these next few moments. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'd be honored through our singing, through our playing, through our worship. In Jesus' name. Thanks again for watching this message of Bell Road Church. We hope that God spoke to you through it. Be sure to connect with us online via Twitter, Facebook and at bellroadchurch.com.